the story of Christmas is a story of love. It was light and angels that gave guidance to those blessed to be a part of those transcendent events. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. One of the most beautiful symbols of the birth of Jesus Christ into this world is light. The appearance of the long-promised Messiah brought light to a darkened world. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple. Simon knew through the power of the Holy Ghost that this was indeed the Christ, the Son of the Most High. Let this be a time of remembrance, of gratitude, and a time of forgiveness. Let it be a time to ponder the atonement of Jesus Christ and its meaning for each of us personally. We, like the wise man of old, should seek the Christ and lay before him the most precious of gifts, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. wondrous gift is given, so God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in the world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. The Savior came freely to all, and his gifts were of value beyond measure. Throughout his ministry, he blessed the sick, restored sight to the blind, made the deaf to hear, and the halt and the lame to walk. He gave cleanliness to the unclean. He restored breath to the lifeless. He gave hope to the despairing, and bestowed light in the darkness. Because he came, we know how to reach out to those in trouble or distress, wherever they may be. Because he came and paid for our sins, we have the opportunity to gain eternal life. The spirit of Christmas is the spirit of love and of generosity and of goodness. May his precious spirit be with us and may he ever be the center of our celebrations. With the pure love of Christ, let us walk in his footsteps as we approach the season celebrating his birth. As we do so, let us remember that he still lives and continues to be the light of the world. Christmas is that rarest of seasons when we see others with new eyes, when we open our hearts a little more to the beauty around us. 
and reach out to others with a little more kindness and compassion. As adults, if we're lucky, every now and again we can briefly catch a glimpse of what it feels like to be a child once more. The thought of that someone we love is doing something special for us and our excitement about the special thing we are planning to do for them warms our hearts and fills us with love and anticipation. Add to this the glimmering lights, the delightful decorations, the sublime scenes of Christ's birth, and it's no wonder Christmas is such a beloved time of year. And then, of course, there's the music. Nothing underscores the deep meaning and gentle spirit of the season quite like Christmas carol. Whether the melodies are cheerful, reflective, or nostalgic, there's something about Christmas that inspires glorious music. These wonderful Christmas harmonies lift our spirits and remind us of the reason for our rejoicing. Today, we are most fortunate to have the opportunity to hear the heavenly music performed by the orchestra at Temple Square and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. The music performed by this group is so sublime, I like to imagine that the angels of heaven occasionally lean in to listen and even sing along. The choir just sung one of the most beautiful Christmas melodies ever written the enchanting Carol of the Bells, which was first performed in the United States in 1921. Originally, it wasn't a Christmas carol at all. It was based on a centuries-old Ukrainian folk song known as Sketrik, often translated as the Generous One. Ukrainian families used to sing this song at the beginning of the new year. The original lyrics tell, of, tell us of a swallow that flies into a family's house and foretells the marvelous good fortune that awaits them during the coming year. I like the feeling of that story. I love its message of hope and optimism. Isn't that the message of Christmas? Even when the world may appear quite dark, when things aren't going right, when our hearts are overflowing with disappointment and worry, even in the midst of sadness and sorrow, we sing about joy to the world and goodwill toward man because of Christ, who came to give light to them that sit in darkness. How appropriate, then, that the beloved Christmas carol we just heard was originally titled The Generous One. Christmas is, after all, a time of generosity. Inspired by that spirit, we sometimes spend hours looking for the perfect gift to give our friends and families. We seek ways to be more helpful and cheerful. We are prompted to spend a little more time with those we love we become more aware of those in need, and often we extend ourselves more generously to aid them. All of this is our imperfect but heartfelt echo of the generosity of our Savior, whose birth we seek to honor. But we all know that too often the spirit of Christmas can become overshadowed and even lost in the frantic pace and pressures of shopping, bills, and packed schedules. I don't want to encourage cringe-like behavior, but allow me to say that some of my fondest Christmas memories are of exchanging gifts, getting lost in the bustle of crowds and attending joyful events, small and large, that bring people together at this time of the year. Yes, there are many reasons to enjoy these things, but of course, there's so much more. Therefore, I invite each one of us to find during this Christmas season a moment in the quiet of our souls to acknowledge and offer 
heartfelt gratitude to the generous one. Let us consider the compassionate, beloved, and boundless mercy of our Father in heaven. As we shop for gifts, as we give and receive them, may we also take time to quietly contemplate the bountiful gifts God has showered upon us, his children. One example I learned about involved a man who lived in Africa. Because of a disability, this man had never been able to walk. He was forced to spend most of his time in his parents' home. He could not work. He could not go out with his friends. He could not do even the simple things we take so much for granted. Then he heard something remarkable. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was bringing wheelchairs to an event not far from his home. He asked a friend to ask to take him to the event. And there he watched as dozens of disabled men, women, and children were lifted into new gleaming wheelchairs. Oh, how he wanted to sit in one of those chairs. How it would change his life for a moment if he could move about by his own power. He waited in line until finally it was his turn. Two men lifted him into a chair, and for the first time in his life, he was able to move freely. At first, he moved about hesitantly. But as he got the feel of the wheelchair, he moved more courageously. He turned, twisted, and sprinted. He waved enthusiastically with both hands as he raced past his friends. He flew. The look on his face was one of joy. After a time, however, he slowly wheeled the chair back to the others, and with an expression of calm resignation, he prepared to be helped out. What are you doing? his friend asked. The man smiled and shrugged his shoulders. It is someone else's turn now, he said. The church humanitarian missionary knelt beside him and said, this wheelchair is yours. The man couldn't believe it. He had assumed this event was only to demonstrate what it was like to ride in a wheelchair. Is it truly mine, he asked. Yes, but I have no money. It is yours. It is a gift from people who love you. When the reality of what was happening finally sank in, this humble man looked at his friend. He looked at the missionary. He tried to hold back the tears, but it was in vain. And as he wept, he laughed at the sheer joy of what he felt. His friend and the missionary wept with him. Thank you, he said in a whisper. He hugged them both, settled into his chair, and then with a whoop, he took off again with a big smile. I can fly, he shouted, as he sped back and forth along the pavement. This man understood gratitude. Have we ever felt such pure, unbounded thankfulness? During this Christmas season and throughout the year, I pray that we will remember the generous one our God, our Father, our beloved Shepherd and Counselor, for He is the gift giver. He is the generous one. When we, His children, plead for bread, He does not hand us a stone. Rather, He endows us with gifts so sublime and precious that they exceed our ability to fully comprehend and even imagine. He gives us peace, joy, abundance, protection, provision, favor, hope, confidence, love, salvation, eternal life. 
This Christmas season, we celebrate the greatest gift of all, the one that makes all other gifts possible, the birth of the babe of Bethlehem. Because of him, the grave hath no victory, and the sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. He is the light and the life of the world. Yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened. I joyfully give thanks to God for his generosity. He saves us from loneliness, emptiness, and unworthiness. He opens our eyes and our ears. He transforms darkness to light, grief to hope, and loneliness to love. He frees us from a past of slavery and selfishness and opens the path to a present of purpose and a future of fulfillment. This is he whom we worship. This is our God. This is the generous one. This is he who loves his children so completely that he offered his only begotten son that all who follow him will not perish but have everlasting life. Because of Jesus the Christ, we need never feel like strangers again. We will rise with the just when he returns, and because of his perfect life and eternal sacrifice, one day we can stand with the angels of heaven and receive with them an eternal gift. May we, this Christmas season, remember our generous Heavenly Father and give profound and heartfelt thanks to our Almighty God who has given all of his children wings to fly. At Christmas time, we celebrate our Heavenly Father's 
perfect gift of His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. In token of this greatest of gifts, the Christmas season becomes, for most of us, a time of finding joy in giving to others. You and I have learned from experience how challenging that can be. In 1970, I was the father of three young boys. Like many novice parents, I was working hard to provide for a growing family. Two days after Christmas, I knew I needed to take a long business trip, leaving my wife Kathleen to entertain the boys during their holiday from school. Knowing that their happiness might well depend on having good Christmas gifts to play with, we chose our gifts carefully. To our oldest son, then seven, we gave a barometer, a device for forecasting the weather. <laughs> we discovered that, quote, some assembly was required. <laughs> My son and I sat down to put together his beautiful new barometer. We laid out dozens of pieces and carefully studied the complex assembly instructions. After a few hours, it became clear to me that even if we correctly assembled all of the pieces, something seemed to be wrong with the mechanism for making the barometer fluid go up and down. I tried to hide my doubts from my son, but late that night, after he had gone to bed, I was so frustrated that I used my journal to draft a complaint letter to the company <laughs> that made the barometer. Here is part of that letter, which I'm glad I never sent. <laughs> Quote, our son is delighted with his barometer. He is seven and has faith in anything so handsome must surely work. I hope that the weather doesn't change before we get your reply since I don't want to sneak upstairs to defraud him by setting it by hand, and I don't want him to lose faith in your barometer. Please tell me how to make it work. It's not your credibility but mine that will suffer unless you help. Now, human help did not arrive in time for that Christmas gift to work but our son. Now, a father himself remembers the love we shared as we helped each other, and he still feels the faith we had in the unfailing order of God's creation of earth and atmosphere that makes the art of weather forecasting possible. That faith was undiminished by our frantic efforts to get a barometer to work. We learn from that what you know from your experiences. Success in giving joy at Christmas usually involves help from others. It is rarely found in solitary effort. Joining with others spreads the joy and makes it more lasting. And perhaps most important, invoking faith in the Savior, the Creator, and source of all lasting happiness invites the pure love of God, which is the greatest of all gifts and the sure source of enduring joy. That reality was bit deeper in our hearts during a Christmas season years after our adventure with the barometer. I decided to design and build a wooden treasure chest for my wife. I needed the generous help of many others who had the tools and the skills I lacked. I worked with them for weeks. I also needed the help of the Holy Ghost to discover ways to convey love and faith in the gospel in that gift. On the lid, I carved our family monogram. On the front, I placed 
two panels. On one panel, I carved my initial and my wife's initial on the other. The box can only be unlocked by using two different keys, one to open the lock by my initial and the other the lock by my wife's initial. We now use it, that as a family treasure box. So on the Christmas when it was under the tree and all the days since, seeing the box has filled our minds and hearts with love for each other and for the Savior's sacrifice that makes eternal marriage and families possible. The box, now filled with family pictures and sheets of Christmas music, rests near the old piano in our living room. Creating that gift brought a feeling of love for family and the Master. From time to time, I still see and thank the people who helped me create that box. When I see them, again, I can feel the joy we shared in creating a gift of love for a family and a token of the love we shared for the Savior. I see joy in the smiles of my friends as I did when we worked on the box together. You know from your experiences during Christmas seasons that such shared joy can come from creating and offering even simple gifts of love. For instance, many of you have helped a child to take plates of cookies to those who feel especially alone at Christmas, to the person receiving this modest gift from a child, it can appear as precious as frankincense. And a child bringing such a gift can remind them of the Magi bringing gifts from the East to the Savior. Both giver and recipient can remember Christ and feel love and gratitude. Families also offer priceless gifts of love and testimony at Christmas time through music as well as words. As a young boy, I would gather with my family around our Winkler piano, now more than 100 years old and badly out of tune. That piano rests in our living room near the treasure chest. The piano still is a precious heirloom because it was dear to my mother as a gift from her husband when they were poor. My parents had known poverty and so were frugal. The Christmas gifts we received were modest, but my mother had a rich soprano voice. She played her piano at Christmas as she led us in singing familiar carols and sacred hymns. I don't know if she thought of herself as inviting us to share in a lasting gift, but even as a young boy, I felt inexpressible joy in singing those songs. The music filled our small home with a spirit of peace. I could feel not only the love of my mother and father and two brothers, but of my heavenly Father and the Savior, Jesus Christ. I sensed that the love I felt then was something I had experienced before, before this life in the spirit world. I wanted more than anything else to feel it someday in a home of my own. And I wanted to live so that I could return with a family of my own to our heavenly home where I knew Heavenly Father and the Savior would be waiting, waiting. Now, when I see the treasure box and that piano, memories of love with my family and love from the Savior flood back over me. As we sing in choirs, families, and classes, and as we have listened together tonight, the carols of Christmas remind us of our shouts of joy when we learned that we could come to this world and be given a Savior to redeem us. Someday we will sing those songs with the hosts of heaven. It is my prayer that the Spirit will bless us this Christmas and in the years to come with the power to offer other gifts of love and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and his restored gospel. I know that the Spirit can lead each of us in many and simple ways to give love, faith, and joy to others at this season of rejoicing. 
I testify that Jesus Christ was the literal Son of God and the Savior of the world. He was the perfect gift from our loving Father. At this and every season, our Savior invites us to join with Him and others to offer the priceless gift of joy. I pray that we will. Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him.
Christmas season with its special meaning and beauty often prompts a tear, inspires a renewed commitment to God, and provides, borrowing the words from the lovely song, Calvary, rest to the weary and peace to the soul. However, it is easy to get caught up in the pressure of the season and perhaps lose the very spirit in our lives trying to gain, overdoing. It is especially common this time of the year for many of us. This causes for this night might include too many Christmas activities to attend, too much to eat, too many expectations, and too much tension. Often our efforts at Christmas time result in our feeling stressed out, wrung out, and worn out. During the time we should feel the simple joys of commemorating the birth of our Savior. Finding the real joy of Christmas comes not in the hurrying and the scurrying to get more done, nor is it found in the purchasing of gifts. We find real joy when we make the Savior the focus of the season. We can keep Him in our thoughts and in our lives as we go about the work He would have us perform here on earth. At this time particularly, let us follow His example as we love and serve our fellow man. A segment of our society desperately yearning for an expression of love is found among those growing older, and particularly when they suffer from pangs of loneliness, the chill wind of dying hopes and vanished dreams whistles through the ranks of the elderly and those who approach the declining side of the summit of life. Wrote Elder Richard L. Evans some years ago, and I quote, what they need in the loneliness of their older years is in part at least what we needed in the uncertain years of our youth, a sense of belonging, an assurance of being wanted, and the kindly ministrations of loving hearts, not merely dutiful formality, nor merely a room in a building, but room in someone's heart and life. We cannot bring them back the morning hours of youth, but we can help them live in the warm glow of a sunset made more beautiful by our thoughtfulness, by our provision, and by our active and unfeigned love." End quote. My brothers and sisters, true love is a reflection of the Savior's love. In December of each year, we call it the Christmas spirit. You can hear it. You can see it. You can feel it. Recently, I thought back to an experience from my boyhood, an experience I've related on another occasion or two. I was just 11. Our primary president, Melissa, was an older and loving gray-haired lady. One day at primary, Melissa asked me to stay behind and visit with her. There the two of us sat in the otherwise empty chapel. She placed her arm about my shoulder and began to cry. Surprised, I asked her why she was crying. She replied, I can't seem to get the trail builder boys to be reverent during the opening exercises of primary. Would you be willing to help me, Tommy? I promised Melissa that I would. Strangely to me, but not to Melissa, they had ended any problem of reverence in the primary. She had gone to the source of the problem. Me. <laughs> the solution was love. The years flew by. Marvelous Melissa, now in her 90s, lived in a nursing facility in the northwest part of Salt Lake City. Just before Christmas, I determined to visit my beloved primary president. Over the car radio, I heard the song, Hark! The herald angels sing, glory 
to the newborn king. I reflected on the visit made by wise men those long years ago. They brought gifts of gold, of frankincense, and of myrrh. I brought only the gift of love and a desire to say thank you. I found Melissa in the lunchroom. She was staring at her plate of food, teasing it with the fork she held in her aged hand. Not a bite did she eat. As I spoke to her, my words were met by a benign but blank stare. I took the fork in hand and began to feed Melissa, talking all the time I did so about her service to boys and girls as a primary worker. There wasn't so much as a glimmer of recognition, far less a spoken word. Two other residents of the nursing home gazed at me with puzzled expressions. Unless one of them spoke, saying, Don't talk to her. She doesn't know anyone, even her own family. She hasn't said a word in all the time she's been here. Luncheon ended. My one-sided conversation wound down. I stood to leave. I held her frail hand in mine, gazed in her, into her wrinkled but beautiful countenance, and said, God bless you, Melissa. Merry Christmas. Without warning, she spoke the words, I know you. You're Tommy Moss and my primary boy. How I love you. She pressed my hand to her lips, bestowed a kiss on it, and a sweet kiss filled with love. Tears coursed down her cheeks and bathed our clasped hands. Those hands that day were hallowed by heaven and graced by God. The herald angels did sing. The words of the master seemed to have a personal meaning, never before fully felt. Woman, behold thy son. And to his disciple, behold thy mother. From Bethlehem, there seemed to echo the words, how silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven, no ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. President David O. McKay said, True happiness comes only by making others happy. The spirit of Christmas makes our heart glow in brotherly love and friendship and prompts us to kind deeds of service. It is the spirit of the gospel of Jesus Christ." End quote. There is no better time than now, this very Christmas season, for all of us to rededicate ourselves to the principles taught by Jesus the Christ. It is the time to love the Lord, our God with our all heart and our neighbors as ourselves. It's real to remember that he who gives money gives much. He who gives time gives more. But he who gives of himself gives all. Let us make Christmas real. It isn't just tinsel and ribbon, unless we have made it so in our lives. Christmas is the spirit of giving without a thought of getting. It is happiness because we see joy in people. It's forgetting self and finding time for others. It is discarding the meaningless and stressing the true values. It is peace because we found peace in the Savior's teachings. It is the time we realize most deeply that the more love is expended, the more there is of it for others. There's Christmas in the home and church. There's Christmas in the mart. 
you'll not know what Christmas is unless it's in your heart. The bells may cross across the snow, and carols search the air, but oh, the heart will miss the thrill unless it's Christmas there. As the Christmas season envelops us with all His glory, may we, as did the wise men, seek a bright, particular star to guide us through our Christmas opportunity in service to our fellow man. May we all make the journey to Bethlehem in spirit, taking with us a tender, caring heart as our gift to the Savior. And may one and all have a joy-filled Christmas.